Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on Chapter 1 of the Spurrier and Topi uh, textbook, Systems Analysis and It Design in an Age of Options. Um, as, uh, as is a typical, we begin by with uh, a couple of slides that list the learning objectives for the chapter. And I'm not going to read through them. Uh, I think they read well on their own. I do put a copy of the slides up on my um, weekly schedule. And so um, you can find them there. And they correspond pretty well to the discussion that's in the book. I think they're thoughtful. I think they make a lot of sense. Um, I just don't want to burn up the time on them. Okay? Okay, so uh, the outline of the chapter. There's the introduction. And then they talk about the core role of the BA. The BA is the, is the business analyst. This is a title that they're using in place of systems analyst. It's pretty... Uh, it's pretty common. It's a pretty common uh, title used in the business world uh, today. Okay. And they're saying that the core role is software requirements analysis. Um, then the next part beyond systems analysis and design requirements analysis, understanding the big picture of systems projects in the plan driven approach. Okay, so they're going to give you, a, I'm going to give you as I go through the material, a, uh, a pretty comprehensive review of the tr traditional approach to systems analysis and design, one that they're calling here plan driven approach. The next section, a major alternative to plan driven agile approaches. So that's that's the second stuff that we're going to go through. Uh, the next section, the business analyst in the age of options. Uh, the next one, security, a critically important topic that involves every team member. And then they have a discussion of case studies and many cases in this uh, teaching of the class that I'm teaching in the fall of uh, 2021. We're not going to be using any of the cases from the book, so I won't be discussing them in the lecture. Uh, and then they have a summary uh, to finish up. Okay, um, so this activity that we're doing is all about software systems, right? Um, yeah, people do talk about systems analysis in other kinds of contexts, but the context that we're using is uh, we're using systems analysis related to software, okay? And so what do people use the software for? Um, well, uh, they use them uh, to automate the transactions in their business. Um, it, it, they use it to get management information. That's information that they use in the management of their business. Um, and ideally, they would like to find some kind of uh, software and hardware solution that puts them way ahead of their competitors. And to the extent that they take another approach that puts them way ahead, they call that disruptive. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Um, one question that they pose that not everyone does is, why do we need uh, you know, why do we need a professional to, to do systems analysis? Can't we just get software to design itself? And then I think they have a really thoughtful uh, discussion about why we can't. Okay, first of all, the stuff that we're going to learn to do in the course is very creative. And it has to do with things that uh, people do in the business. And when I say the business in this uh, context, I mean the business of whatever you're doing. 
So it, it could be for profit business activity. It could be higher education. It could be research. It could be medicine and health. It could be uh, government. So when we talk about business here, we're talking about it in the in the context of, you know, the things you do to further the goals of the enterprise, whatever enterprise you're part of, not just, you know, for profit commercial stuff. Right. So there are plenty of things that we're helping um, in the business that are uh, creative in their own right. And for us to help them, we need to take a creative approach. Uh, not really something that uh, software has really proven to be that good at yet. So we have to do it ourselves. We can't just press the button and get systems analysis done for us. There's a lot of complex communication. And the ones that I think of are, there's a lot to be done in talking to people about their jobs. Okay, because the kind of software solutions that we're talking about are the ones that help people get their jobs done. Either ones that they're having problems with now, okay, that's kind of a problem, or some kind of opportunity. There's maybe some kind of thing that they'd like to do in their, in their work that they can't even do. It's not feasible without additional capabilities that could be provided by uh, software solutions. OK, and um, so to find out about those things, we have to talk to people. OK, or uh, could we press a button and have the computer talk to people? N not very well. OK, um, large frame pattern recognition. I think this is a real insight that the authors have um, that I really like. Uh, we're having a lot of success these days at teaching uh, at computers and their application software to recognize uh, patterns, even uh, uh, patterns that are not easily recognized by humans. OK, and, it, and this has given rise to machine learning applications and all those kinds of, of, of things. but. We're looking for patterns in an even larger uh, context. We're looking for patterns in the context of um, oh, kind of understanding the overall goals of the organization, uh, recognizing where things are going wrong in the organization, recognizing opportunities for the organization, uh, trying to say what that might have to do with people's work and the system that, that supports it. Again, this kind of stuff is not the kind of stuff where we're going to press a button and have a machine and some application tell us what to do. Maybe someday, but we're far from it uh, uh, now. Uh, kind of related to complex communication, asking interesting uh, questions. Um, uh, the role of the systems analyst is largely being a facilitator. OK, um, we're talking to people uh, who have either problems or opportunities, and they have a general idea that these are going to involve a system solution. And so they uh, come to us. And um, these are not the kind of things where we can kind of, uh, you know, kind of turn around and open a cabinet and go, I've got this, this thing for you. OK, uh, first of all, we have to understand what their problem or their opportunity is. OK, another thing is we're going to have to understand uh, where they sit in the organization. Are they are they a person who has uh, the power and the resources to engage us? Uh, to help them, or they're just a person who's looking for someone to talk to. Okay, so a lot of what we're going to do with the people who we, we're going to work with is asking questions of them and hearing answers back and asking questions again. Um, although you can teach a computer to do some things like this, they're not really going to be able to do it on the scale and with the Oh, with the kind of insightfulness and empathy that it's going to take to do a good job of it. 
maybe someday, but not today. And we need a lot of common sense, right? People in their jobs, okay, they have to do a lot of things that take common sense. Sometimes they're so used to doing things the way they do them, or they're so used to being constrained by the rules that have been imposed upon them that they can't even see alternatives. Okay, so we're going to be we're going to be a person or a team of people who are going to talk to people about their problems and maybe we're going to help them think about them in a different way and some of that is just going to have to come with well the common sense that we bring to the problem okay so um this is not something that you can give to a computer to do this is a very rewarding and challenging job for humans, and we're going to learn about it. Um, so here's a nice slide with some graphics that kind of talks about um, what kind of what kind of things might go on in, um, you know, cr the process of creating software. Okay. Oh, in uh, picture one, it looks like they're meeting with a group of people to talk about uh, problems and, and opportunities that might be addressed by software. And uh, they're trying to document those. Okay. Um, uh, in the middle, uh, it looks like we're looking at a bunch of programmers who are going to write uh, software. And certainly, um, uh, a lot of um, computer-based solutions requ require writing uh, a custom uh, software or the configuration of software that's already been created. Uh, these technical people in the middle picture, they look like they do a good job. Um, and then the last thing we have is implementation over here on the right side. And I think for really going to understand what they meant by the uh, photo here is uh, here's a group of people in a meeting. Maybe they're talking about rolling out the new system. And um, a lot of stuff has to be done. You know, we've built the system, but we have to install it. We, we have to convert uh, data from the old system. Uh, we have to we have to train our staff. We need to introduce it to our customers. So much to do to implement a solution like this. And uh, I think we're to imagine that these uh, people are very calmly sharing their ideas about how to roll out the solution that has been uh, created. Okay, so what so what does the systems analyst do? Uh, so here we have an interesting slide. The core role of the BA, the business analyst, software requirements analysis. So why do they call the um, why are they calling this the business analyst? Um, well, I'll give you some reasons. One is. Um, the people who wrote this book, I think if you really look at where they teach, they teach at business uh, schools, at least one does. So these are technical people who are teaching uh, business uh, people, okay? Um, and to get respectability in a business school, uh, maybe calling a business analyst gets you a few more points. Uh, the second is, if you go out in the field and you see all the people who are working in American corporations and who are playing this kind of role, especially people who do not have a programming background, when they take on this analyst role, they'll get the title business analyst. Okay. Um, why business? Well, they want them for sure to understand the business. They want them to understand the requirements. And again, I have to remind you, by business, I don't mean only commercial enterprises. I'm talking about, you know, commercial enterprises, higher education, scientific research, government, 
uh, medicine and health, all those things, all the things that we do. Okay. So that's how, how um, it typically, it, it, people who play this uh, kind of a role, who don't have a technical background, they're called a business analyst. Okay. People who play this kind of role, who maybe have a programming kind of background, they're more comfortable be, being called systems analysts. Okay. But what role are we talking about? We're talking about, here's, here's a big thing that we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to elicit, document, and analyze the requirements for software, either completely new software, revising software, the software that we buy that we need to configure. We, as the analysts, we're going to, we are going to be the person or persons responsible for understanding the requirements uh, and analyzing them. Okay, so one thing to know is that this is pretty risky business, all right? Now, uh, one study that you see quoted all the time is the one that we hear, uh, see here. There was a consulting firm called the Standish Group, and they did a study in 1995, and they went out and asked uh, people in a uh, in business uh, generally, and again, all professions. And they said, with respect to IT projects, um, how many are successful? And they got pretty dismal answers. 16% were completely successful. 53% 50 failed to, to fully meet expectations. And 31% were canceled prior to delivery. Okay, so um, uh, I just always like whenever I talk about uh, the Standish Group and the study, I always want to I always want to discount this a bit. This is this is very bleak. Okay, now uh, when you read in the text when they talk about this, they would say I think they said. Uh, something like this. If you were going to build a new office building for your, for your, um, for your organization, and somebody told you that it was only 16% likely to be completely successful, would you even go do that? And the answer is no. Okay. But um, the there's there's a nuance in how you pose the question. Uh, okay, um, this thing that is is really looming big here is fifty three percent failed to fully meet expectations. Okay, well, what do we mean to fully meet expectations? So, uh, here's the question that I pose. Okay, it may be true that only sixteen percent met the expectations that everybody had when the project started. Uh, okay, but there's this whole big group that may have met the expectations as they evolved over the life of the project. Okay, and a lot of those are successful. Okay, even if you're building a building, you know, when you start the project, you, you have a concept of what the building is like, and you work with the project managers and the architects and the engineers and all that kind of stuff. And you better believe that, that that idea evolves while you're working on it, okay? Now, I think if that were true, um, they wouldn't count that in the, into that 16% completely successful, okay? So, I mean, there are a lot of IT projects uh, that evolve during the project. And did they meet all the original ideas that everybody had when they started? Uh, no, they don't. But uh, do we get to the end of the project? Uh, and do people kind of understand how they got there? And maybe they got there in a responsible way? I would say that in my mind, uh, a good half of IT uh, projects uh, uh, get the completion, 
everybody understands how they got there. Yeah, ideas had changed over the life of the project, um, but uh, that was expected, okay? Uh, so that, uh, now, the 31% uh, percent that we canceled, uh, those are serious. I think that, I think you ought to think about that as being pretty dismal, okay? So, uh, even if you're only worried about 31% of the projects, which is kind of what I'm telling you to worry about, okay, uh, that's pretty serious all the same, that you, you have a one-third chance that you're going to cancel the project. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement, okay? And why do we have so much opportunity in 1995, which is, again, 16 years ago now, uh, as we're in late August uh, 2021, um, uh, um, uh, why was this so hard? Okay. And a couple of reasons. One, software is is pretty hard to uh, design and to construct and to test what we have here is a uh, a java program uh not one that i think is particularly well written but i'm sort of uh, a java snob um and you can see that uh for instance it's it would be very hard to take this kind of information and show it to people who, who are going to use the system in the business and say, is this right? They don't know if it, it's right. It looks like uh, Java code. Okay. So um, in, in general, a problem that uh, software has is its intangibility. Okay. Uh, if we're building a building, Okay, and the crew is working on the building. And let's we kind of say we come up out for a site inspection. Well, we can kind of walk the floors. We can see, well, are all the slabs poured? Is the elevator shaft in the right place? Do we seem to have columns in the right place? You know, there are physical things to examine that we can do just by walking around. It's much harder to inspect software projects okay so uh we'll leave this slide to represent the difficulty of uh, seeing along the way how well your software development project is going it's not as easy as if we were building an office building or a, a single family home or uh, something like that, or a road, or a bridge, right? If they start to build the bridge in the wrong uh, direction, it's like everybody's going to come to your office and say, hey, <laughs> you know, they're building the bridge uh, to the north instead of to the east, but less obvious with uh, software. Um, so... Uh, Another problem that we have is that um, sometimes even when we build the software and we get the software to run, um, uh, sometimes it doesn't run as we uh, designed it. Why? Maybe we didn't uh, test it, right? So uh, it doesn't even meet the requirements as we stated them, as we understood them, okay? We have a poor implementation of the requirements. Sometimes we've not done as good of a job as we need to on the requirements. So we could have wrong features, okay? What does the system need uh, to do? We could have gotten that wrong. So we, we could have given the user uh, community a, a perfectly good system that does something very well, it's just not what they need to do their job. It's not going to help them to solve their problems and capitalize on their opportunities. Um, uh, we, could have, we could have the wrong uh, 
uh, uh, design. So we could uh, kind of understand the requirements and the features that meet them, but uh, we could have done a bad job on uh, designing the data, for instance, or the logic, or one one thing that we're very uh, sensitive here at a, a, a school of information science is the usability of the system. <laughs> Perhaps the user interface is such that, uh, you know, we may have gotten the requirements uh, right. We may have built the thing that we intended, but it may not interact that well with the users. And so it may help them to get their job done, but in a really frustrating way. These are all things that can go wrong. Okay, so how, do, how, how does the BA, or I like to say systems analyst, how does the systems analyst help with this? Well, the systems analyst is primarily concerned, I mean, they're concerned with a lot of activities in the systems uh, development process, but the two that they're the most interested in and key to are analysis and uh, design. Okay, so what would we, what would we do doing analysis, or as I call it here, business analysis? Well, we have to come up with a vision for the product. Okay, we have to come up. We have to understand how the business process works. Now, often people do this with uh, models. They'll they'll create. Uh, charts. We have these things called activity diagrams. That's one way to express a, a business uh, process. And we go talk to people in the business, and then we see how um, we, uh, we see how uh, goods and information flow through the business. Okay, uh, domain uh, models. Those are mostly uh, data models where we where we express. These are the data that we think that we need to capture and maintain in the system in order to do our job. So the vision, the process, the data. Features. What features should uh, the system have? Uh, okay. One very popular way of expressing the features that a system should have are these things called user stories. And we'll see one in a couple of minutes. Um, it's basically saying, how will a particular kind of user use our system to get their job done? Okay, either get their job done or get the enjoyment that they want from the system. Some systems that we build are entertainment. Right, so it's not all uh, get the job done. But how do they get the benefits that they're expecting from our software? And another thing that's helpful is for is for us uh, to document how will we know when the system really uh, meets um, the expectations of the user stories, and these are uh, called acceptance uh, criteria. Um, we also, as analysts, we ought to be thinking about non-functional requirements. Things like security, performance, uh, response time, all those kinds of things. Uh, usability. Okay, So all those things are part of analysis, and all those things are very much of interest to the systems analyst person or persons that we're talking about in the course. Okay, N now we've got design. Okay, okay, so um, they talk about functional uh, designs. Uh, okay, um, they think, these uh, two authors, uh, Spurrier and Topi, the kinds of things that you would be interested in uh, design would be use uh, cases. Use cases are kind of more detailed versions of user stories. Uh, okay, so they say, well, once we kind of understand what the requirements are at a high level, maybe we need to expand them out into more detailed narratives of how the users use the system called use uh, cases. Um, 
and uh, we need to design the user experience and the user interface. Okay, and then other things have to go on. A technical uh, designs, architecture. What do we mean by architecture? Well, what kind of computing solution is this uh, going to be? Is this going to be a single user system that's using an Excel spreadsheet? Okay. Um, is this going to be a web application system used by um, uh, hundreds of people uh, that uh, is a three-tier client server uh, system that we build ourselves? Um, is this going to be some kind of service that we uh, subscribe to, like salesforce.com, uh, that runs in the cloud? Those kinds of architecture kinds of uh, uh, questions. Uh, logical data models and database uh, design. Um, that's more, t d more details about the data. So we talked about uh, domain models up here in analysis and logical data models and database uh, design. It's just more details about the design for uh, data. And class and sequence uh, diagrams are uh, diagrams that some people use uh, before they write uh, programs. Okay, so class and sequence uh, diagrams would be used as some kind of a specification uh, from which you would write a, a program. So these are analysis and design activities, and these are things that the analyst uh, might get involved with. Now, no matter what flavor of analyst you are, okay, whether you have a programming kind of a background or not, okay, uh, you're definitely going to get involved in analysis, okay? When we get to uh, design, are you going to be doing all this kind of work? Well, it kind of depends on how technical you are. Could you work on use uh, cases? Yeah, I think you could. Could you work on user experience and user interface? Well, there's probably nothing like super technical about that to keep you from doing it. You might want to work with a person who was more expert at the techniques. You could certainly supervise them or... Uh, collaborate with them. What about some of the technical uh, design things like architecture, uh, logical data models, class and sequence uh, diagrams? These things are all so technical that if you were, you know, a business analyst, you were a person who was not going to be very uh, uh, technical. Again, you'd probably be collaborating with the people who did these more uh, detailed things. Or if you were more of a technical person, you might actually get involved in doing these things. Okay. But these areas of interest are all important areas to either kind of systems analysts, the more technical one and the more business oriented one. Okay. Okay. So how do user stories work? User stories have come from the more uh, contemporary agile approach to systems analysis and uh, design. And a lot of people like them for a way to express the requirements. And so these authors of our textbook, they've uh, decided that everybody ought to use them. Even if you're taking a traditional approach, they think, the first expression of the requirements should be these user stories. Does everybody agree with that? No, they don't. Okay. Um, these authors think that the first expression of, of uh, what the system should do should be user stories. And then the next expression should be these use uh, cases. Okay. Um, other people... Uh, it, disagree. They think that if you're not taking an agile approach, you should not fool with user stories at all. And the first thing that you should do is a use case uh, narrative. And it just ought to be kind of uh, general. And then later on, you'll beef it up and it'll be a more detailed use case uh, 
narrative. Um, I kind of like what the authors are doing here. Uh, user stories are so prevalent in our business culture these days that the idea that we might all come to agree that this is the first way that we ought to express the requirements, I think it's a good idea. Okay, so here's what we do. You can see they look like they're on index uh, cards. And this was an idea that the Agile folks had. They said, we don't want to create a lot of documentation. So we want to create uh, a user story that will fit on an index card. And they've got one part that goes on the front and another part that goes on the back. So this first part, as a user role, I want to accomplish goal via software capability so that I gain business benefit. That usually goes on the front of the card. And you fill in the blanks, right? The acceptance uh, criteria, which not everyone does, but this is, I think, a good way to really fully understand the requirement they put on the back of the card. Okay. Uh, so what would they look like? Okay. So uh, as a CSR, a customer service rep, I want, need to look up solutions to typical problems so that I can improve customer satisfaction. Okay, so here's a, a customer service rep who's going to be talking to uh, customers and they want to be able to look up solutions by problem. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of broad, but it's certainly a user story. It has all the elements we saw up here. And how do they express the acceptance criteria? Um, acceptance uh, criteria, criteria, they want to search for problem problems using keywords, display one or more solutions corresponding to problems. Okay, so that... So that was the first acceptance uh, criteria. That's what they want to do. That's the result they want to get back. And then the second one, they want to order solutions using stars from the most commonly useful to the least commonly useful. Um, one thing here that I really like about the acceptance criteria is um, even though these are optional, um, they really uh, kind of amplify and bring detail to exactly what we mean by the user story. I mean, here are two kind of feature sets that we're looking for that we might miss one or both of them if we only had this um, user story uh, uh, part. O okay, and uh, you know, people say that you put this on three by five inch cards. If I were to do these on uh, cards, I tend to print big. I would use, say, four by six uh, cards. What most people are doing these days with their user stories is they're not putting on, on the cards. They're typing them into programs that simulate index cards. Um, they have these kind of fields, and you fill them out. Um, but the value added from index card is this idea is this isn't a big document. Okay, this is a lightweight expression of the requirement. Okay, and that gives you some idea about how much text you're expected to have. Okay, so here's another user story example. As a uh, oh, here's the format. As a as a type of customer, I want need some kind of feature so that I can tame some goal or benefit. So we're answering the question, how do people use our system to uh, to meet their needs? Not our needs as system uh, developers or as, as uh, systems analysts. Uh, how do they meet their needs? And their needs are uh, typically solving a problem, uh, capitalizing on an opportunity, or uh, being entertained in some kind of way. Okay, um, so uh, 
typically this includes the who, the what, and the why, but not the how. Okay? We want to leave the how open. Okay? We want to make sure we agree on the who, the what, and the why. Okay? Uh, some examples. As a race car driver, I want a car that can accelerate rapidly so I can pass other drivers. Here's another one. As a race car driver, I want a car that can attain extremely high top speeds so that I can stay ahead of other drivers. As a race car crew chief, I want a car that enables me to change the tires in under 12 seconds so that we don't lose our position during pit stops. Later on, we show you uh, a car that we claim is a Formula One car. Uh, Formula One cars uh, change their tires in well less than at 12 seconds, if you've been following uh, Formula One. So I think the 12 is uh, a bit high. Okay, so um, a lot of the problems that happen with systems is that uh, we, we go off and solve the wrong problem, okay? Or we capitalize on the wrong opportunity, okay? So um, uh, it's really important to understand the requirements before we go shopping for a solution. Now, if the solution is going to be some kind of a vehicle, here's our, here are two cars from, from four, uh, two, uh, vehicles from Ford. Uh, one's probably F-150 and the other is probably, uh, some kind of, uh, reincarnation of, of the Shelby Cobra Mustang or uh, something like that. Okay. These, these solve different kinds of problems. Okay. In fact, they may solve, I can, I can imagine a person who, who's got problems and opportunities that both of these would solve. Okay. For instance, me, <laughs> I'd love to have both. If you were to give me the F one fifty or the the you know the Shelby Cobra, I'll gladly take either of them. I've got wants and needs that are going to be met by either of them. But if I'm out to spend a fixed amount of money, okay, then we've got to settle on which wants and needs we're going to address for me because we probably can't afford both. Okay. Um, design requirements. Okay, so we've got the question, how's the solution going to deliver the features? Okay, so um, even if we know that we want a race car, okay, it's, we need to know more details. Okay, because we're going to go through the design requirements for two different race cars on this uh, slide, and they're different. So the first one, a race car that resembles a regular sedan is optimized to race around a paved oval, making only left-hand turns, and is limited to certain engine sizes as and other specifications to make the racing more competitive based on driver skills. This is a NASCAR car. Okay. And here's the second one. A race car focused on road racing on complicated winding race tracks, making both left and right hand turns and using a highly streamlined body shape and air force to create downforce to maximize the performance of each individual car. This is a Formula One uh, car, o okay? So you can imagine that if we don't spend enough time understanding uh, the requirements, uh, we can easily go and acquire or build a wonderful thing that our client doesn't really need, okay? So it's only by being on top of these things and being very detail-oriented that we're going to get the job done. Oh, and, and so here we have a NASCAR car on the left and uh, an old Formula One car on the, the right. 
uh, Formula One cars have this thing called the halo now, uh, which goes over the driver and make them look uh, appreciably different. So this is a Formula One, uh, one car from a while ago. Uh, okay, both race cars, both really important to the teams, you know, that buy and build them and use them and race with them. But if we accidentally gave the wrong one to the wrong team, it would be a disaster. Okay, now, one of the things I really like about our, our textbook is I think they have a really practical approach to um, systems analysis and uh, design. Even when you come to software and, and hardware-driven computer solutions, uh, okay, we, we, not every project is kind of organized the same way. In particular, when it becomes time to do the implementation, there are some things that we're going to construct from the ground up. We're going to build something completely new. Okay, and there's some things where we're going to go buy a product, a standard off the shelf kind of a project uh, a product, and then we're going to configure it. Okay, so um, there, there are two options, construction and configuration, and it's best to think of them as being on a continuum. Uh, okay, because software projects have a lot of parts. Okay, so we might have a software solution that's entirely constructed from scratch. We might have a solution that is entirely a software that we got off the shelf from some other organization and our role is to configure it, okay? But it's more likely that what we're gonna do is some combination of the two. Okay, so that they, so when you think about a real project that we're going to have, we're going to probably do some amount of construction and some amount of configuration, and we have to figure out how much. Okay, and these are uh, totally different activities. Okay, um, and it, it's sort of good to have them on your mind the whole time. Now, let's talk about construction. This is a traditional uh, approach. Why is that? Well, because a long time ago, uh, I started programming uh, in 1971. That's 50 years ago uh, today. When I started to program, there was not a lot of off-the-shelf software to buy uh, that you could uh, configure. So we built a lot of stuff from, you know, from scratch. Now today, um, there are more options for uh, configuration. So we're calling this a traditional approach because first, there was no software to configure. Now, there is, okay? Um, and uh, typically we're programming new features typically thinks that we just can't find something on the shelf to buy that's worth uh, configuring. And we use uh, programming languages like uh, Java, C Sharp, uh, Python, all those kinds of things. Um, configuration is an increasingly important alternative because there are better and better, um, there are better and better off-the-shelf solutions we can use and configure. Um, what's interesting is that uh, professors who talk about configurable software that we buy, they call it COTS, commercial off-the-shelf software, COTS. What's interesting is that when you get out in industry, you don't hear a lot of people using the word COTS. So uh, COTS is probably, it's a, oh, it's kind of an interest, it's sort of an industry soothsayer, industry analyst a kind of uh, uh, term. You know, I've not had a lot of conversations with people where they go, are you programming this from scratch or are you using COTS? Okay, I'm sure somebody does, but, I haven't talked to a lot of them. 
Okay, so uh, we've got the lay of the land. Now let's get back to the issue is why things go wrong so often. Now, there's a series of cartoons here that you may have already seen. Uh, the idea is we're trying to come up with uh, some kind of a swing uh, or some kind of amusement, okay? Uh, and so we have uh, the pictures, uh, how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how the analyst designed it, how the programmer wrote it, blah, 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 blah. And then in the end, what the customer really needed, a tire swing, okay? And I think what's really nice about this is that you really get sensitized to the issue that we all see things from our own perspective. One phrase that I think is good to remember um, um, is uh, an old phrase about uh, carpenters. It, it says, when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, okay, so what happens here is, is that the conceptualization of this uh, solution is different for everybody. And it and in a lot of the cases, it has to do with what they do. You know, do they hammer nails? Uh, do they build uh, roller coasters? Uh, okay, so um, uh, the, the lesson here is... Uh, Listen, listen to people, question them, probe them, understand what they really need. Don't let your preconceived ideas get in the way. And also, um, don't let their preconceived ideas get in the way. So what's interesting is being a good systems analyst is being a facilitator. I kind of think it's like a technical version of being a social worker, okay? you have to keep thinking what are their needs do we really understand them yet okay and you'll have some people who you talk to who will kind of over specify what they need well i need a spreadsheet to do this and that and that and that and i need it by friday okay over it, it specified uh you may talk to somebody well, you know, we're having some problems with uh, inventory counts, and I think we should do something about it. I'm not sure what. Underspecified, okay? So the real, so this is a really challenging and creative job. This is a lot of fun, okay? Uh, but as you can tell from the pictures, it can go really wrong, okay? I think if you pay attention to, understanding their problem or the opportunities that they want to capitalize upon and keep asking them questions and kind of restating what you hear and keep trying to pull it back to practical things that can be done, uh, you'll do pretty well. But um, this is a funny uh, cartoon and you could easily go down this path. Um, so now we're going to talk about further sort of responsibility of the systems analysts. I like to say systems analysts, so I'm going to do it. Understanding the big picture of systems projects in the plan-driven approach. So we're going to talk about two approaches. Plan-driven approach is what they call the traditional approach. Some people call it waterfall. OK, uh, and then the other one that we're going to talk about is Agile. Most people call that Agile. OK, so plan driven approach first. OK, so plan driven approaches kind of work like building a house or an office building or uh, something like that. Uh, detailed planning is done up front. So we have a picture here, some a uh, professional is looking at uh, the blueprints for the construction of, if that's a house, it's a pretty elaborate house. I'm hoping that's a, a condominium complex. Uh, there aren't a lot of houses that have uh, 
uh, uh, concrete slabs. Uh, certainly mega houses do, but not your average house. Uh, okay, so the building of a building, especially the kind of building that we know a lot about already, uh, apartment houses, single family homes, um, these are the kinds of things where we can usually get most of the details down on paper up front. They're well understood uh, projects. People have been building homes for 3,000 years, a long time, okay? Um, so the plan-driven uh, 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 approach or the traditional uh, uh, approach, some phrases that you hear is, traditional SDLC, System Development Life Cycle. So for a long time, since the 1950s, I guess, or only 1960s, when we said that we needed a way to do this, uh, people came up with uh, a series of phases that we would go through and there'd be a life cycle for a project for system uh, development. And so there are a bunch of different versions of it, but there are a lot of things in common. And people call that the SDLC. Um, it was often expressed as a bunch of boxes that kind of were arranged like a waterfall. So um, a lot of people call this the waterfall uh, approach. So key activities are executed one after the other in a linear sort of uh, sort of approach. Um, some people call this, and this is a relatively new phrase, but I think really insightful, big requirements up front. Okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to settle on what the requirements are at the beginning of the project. And we're going to plan it um, in pretty big uh, detail at the beginning. Okay. This is the a traditional approach to systems analysis. This is what's being called plan-driven approach in this uh, text. Okay, some people I know in this course we're reading other authors who are uh, really only talking about the agile uh, approach, and they don't have as wide of a view as the authors of this uh, text do, and. It, they have a lot of bad things to say about the traditional approach and they sometimes will use the term waterfall in sort of a pejorative way okay and i think that one of the authors uh, one of the, one of the reasons the authors call this the plan driven uh, approach is they want kind of a neutral way to express it um that hasn't been poisoned by uh, the enemies of the plan-driven approach, okay? Here's the waterfall, okay? So um, the idea here is that these uh, boxes are, are phases of the project. Uh, initial vision, business analysis, project plan and implementation approach, functional design, initial technical architecture and design, project approval and execution plan, final technical architecture, implementation via construction and configuration. Okay, and you'll see some diagrams where they go on and they talk about um, installing the system. So not only do you build it, but you install it, then you support it in production and you maintain it. it, it there are some versions of this that have this going around in a circle. Okay. But this is the waterfall. And the, the solid arrows kind of tell the story of uh, the products of one phase, uh, you know, the outputs of each uh, uh, phase become the inputs of the next. And then we have these backward dotted line arrows that a lot of people have not paid a, 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 a attention to. But the uh, proponents of this plan-driven approach historically have said that if you go from phase to phase and you get into trouble, it's just like, eh, we didn't do enough in the last phase, that it's okay to back up and 
start again and you don't have to go all the way to the beginning now the detractors of plan driven approaches are forever saying that people who take a plan driven uh, approach never back up i don't think that's uh, true i mean i i cut I began with plan driven approaches and we backed up a number of times and um, sometimes we got ourselves out of trouble and we got uh, going again and had a very successful uh, project. So I think the dotted line arrows really belong there. Okay, so let's talk about what kind of software there is, what kind of software we build or <laughs> configure. Okay. Uh, these days, we really kind of think about two two kinds of uh, systems. Uh, okay. Uh, one are these um, transaction processing systems that follow the events in the business. And again, by business, I don't only mean for a profit <laughs> capitalist endeavors i'm talking about you know those and science and education and medicine and government and everything right so in any endeavor that you're doing there are lots of events that are happening all the time and we record information about them in order to be able to manage them okay so we have uh, systems that are you know, kind of generically called transaction processing uh, systems that kind of capture the data of the day-to-day -day action and flow of things within our the sphere that we care about. Oh, okay, and they also probably do some reporting they probably do some standard reporting that allow us to do our kind of everyday job so not only do they allow us to keep track of oh who we sold our insurance to and do they have a claim and all that kind of stuff but uh, you know we might have reports or screen that where we could ask for um you know the largest auto claims that we've had in the last 30 days. Yeah, we probably could see that. But these days we have this idea that it's hard to foresee all the questions that management is gonna have about our data. So what we typically do is that we take the data that come out of these transaction processing systems and we typically, um, do this thing called uh, ETL extract extract transact um, extract transform and load and we typically load them into a data warehouse and from that we do data analytics that's where all the data science kind of stuff is done for uh, our enterprise okay um, and then from that we get things like reports dashboards visualization now is it possible that some of these reports and dashboards and visualization come directly out of the transaction processing uh, uh, systems yeah they probably do but again it, this is a simplification okay so this is, I, I think, a good view of the kinds of things that are done. So we, we have a whole lot of these transaction processing systems. Uh, we use them every day to keep our, our business under uh, control. Um, we generate a whole lot of data. There's a lot of effort that goes on to extract the data from these uh, transaction uh, processing uh, systems uh, this ETL uh, process is a lot of work in its own right and then we have uh, data warehouses uh, information uh, marts uh, those kinds of things big uh, databases that we do queries upon um, to give us reports and dashboards and visualizations 
okay so uh, we as systems analysts could be working with our users um, with our uh, stakeholders to make improvements to any part of this overall uh, flow okay we could be uh, there could be changes in the in the kinds of events that are going on in the business and we need to capture those so we'd be working on transaction uh, processing uh, we may be finding that when we go to do our data science and data analytics application that we don't have all the data that we need to to answer the question so we probably have to capture more back here in transaction uh, uh, processing or maybe do a better job of loading and correlating them in this ETL process um, we might find that um, you know we're able to do the analytics but you know the visualizations are bad so maybe we're working in here in the intersection of the analytics and you know the uh, visualization so this is sort of a general flow of how IT systems work within the organization and we could get involved with any of these as a systems analyst okay so let's say that we're talking with um, let's say that we're talking with stakeholders you know these are people who have an interest in the project that's what we mean by a stakeholder a stakeholder is the person who's a interested in the project at hand and they have someone's good, a kind of problem or opportunity how could we as a systems analyst how could we frame it in order to uh, define the project and get things organized well one thing we have to understand is what's the current state okay that's the way that the organization currently operates and they, there are a lot of things uh, to that. It's not just systems, it's procedures, it's people, it's policies, um, it's all of those things, okay? And any one of those things might be related to a problem or an opportunity, okay? So in understanding the current state, we're going to be, um, you know, it typically, people are going to come to us and say I have a problem or opportunity and we're going to say tell me more okay and we want to understand enough about the current state that we can move on and then talk about well how would a future state be different okay so that would be the way that the organization would operate with newer improved software okay and then what are the requirements well here's how we have to think of it the new capabilities are going to be the future state capabilities minus the current state capabilities you know what does the system already do plus refactoring what's refactoring well refactoring is a software term that they haven't used completely accurately here but here's what they're trying to trying to say you know often even the processing that we want to keep in the system it's spread around and intermixed with the stuff that we want to get rid of okay so to the extent that we keep it okay we have to we have to repackage it okay and that's that's a good use of the word refactoring uh, okay so um you know we need to build the new uh, capabilities we need to turn off some of the current uh, capabilities the ones that we don't want anymore and then we're going to have to take the uh, you know the software and systems that we do want to keep and sometimes we're really going to have to work a lot with them uh, to repackage them so we can keep them uh, okay so that's refactoring okay so let's talk about uh, design okay uh, functional design versus uh, technical uh, designs okay so the functional uh, design is how the system works from a customer 
perspective, and we mean a customer of the system, it'd probably be a better thing to say user of the system perspective. Okay. Uh, what's the logic that we need? What are the data that we need to keep? What's the user interface um, that uh, the users are going to use to interact with the system while they're getting their job done. Okay, that's functional design. Technical design and actually uh, in architecture, it focuses on, on the underlying technology. So the technical design is um, it translate the functional designs into programming components. And the architecture is an overall approach to, uh, to data storage, processing, and communications. OK, so if we were doing a real traditional approach to systems uh, development, OK, and that's what we're talking about, because we're talking about plan-based approaches here, um, and functional uh, design, uh, we would have a, a way to express the uh, logic. So we might take um, we may take the expression of the requ requirements that we have in user stories, and we might um, we might uh, sort of replace them or provide more details uh, in a uh, document called a use case. So the way that the authors are kind of explaining things in, in this book, you start with a user story, and then when you want to get more detailed, you go to a use case. OK, so that's probably where the logic would be. Uh, uh, data, how would you do this? Well, uh, you probably would do this thing that we call conceptual data model. We're going to learn how to do that in this uh, course. Um, that expresses an entity relationship uh, diagram. So that's how you would do that. The user interface. Well, there's a lot of ways uh, to design the user interface, um, all the way from uh, drawing uh, pictures of what the screens and the reports look like, you know, kind of mock-ups, uh, but, but uh, paper things. Uh, some people build uh, prototypes of the user interface. They're not implemented by the real software where you can play with them and see you know, what you do. Um, so the team could do a number of things to, to uh, to uh, a document the user interface. Um, a technical design translates functional uh, designs into programming uh, components. Here's where um, uh, traditional uh, teams will sometimes uh, create diagrams um, as a way of, uh, as kind of uh, program specifications. Uh, that's more detailed than we're going to go into in this uh, course, okay? And overall approach to data storage processing and uh, communication. Well, uh, just how we're going to do this, you know, what kind of solution is this uh, going to be? Is this going to be a uh, is this going to be a single user kind of solution that's going to just uh, run on a single uh, computer? Um, is it going to be a three-tier client-server solution that are used by hundreds of users? Um, is it going to be some solution in the cloud, like Salesforce.com, that we're just going to buy, um, you know, we're going to buy, uh, we're going to pay uh, Salesforce.com uh, uh, you know, to support uh, 3,000 salespeople. So, you know, we'll get some price and then we'll sign them up and we'll we'll do a conversion and we'll use uh, that. Those are the kind of questions that relate to architecture. Okay. What about if we weren't taking the big, uh, the big plan upfront approach, the plan-driven 
approach, the waterfall approach, the traditional approach that has a lot of names. Okay. What if we were taking the agile approach? So agile approaches are very popular uh, today. Okay. So you read about it a lot. When you go to talk to employers, they're talking about it. They're saying that they're doing agile. Um, uh, so there's a lot of talk about Agile. So we definitely don't want to get out of this course without understanding what Agile is about, how it might be different from uh, plan-driven. Uh, okay. Um, and we're going to explore it in detail. Okay. So how did Agile come to be? Well, it was motivated by poor project outcomes through the 1990s. Okay, so those were things, uh, you remember that that Standish report that we saw was from 1995. So that was uh, sort of at the height of people's dissatisfaction with, uh, with the uh, a traditional approach. And um, there were a bunch of people that began to do things late in the 90s. Uh, there were a group of people, uh, uh, developers, uh, who had an approach to systems uh, development that they called extreme programming. Um, there were people who came out of uh, product uh, development from all kinds of uh, products like, uh, you know, uh, toothpaste, uh, shaving cream, uh, automobiles, who came up with an approach to product management and product development that they called Scrum, okay? In fact, the first appearance of Scrum in the literature uh, is in a Harvard Business Review article about uh, product uh, uh, development doesn't have anything to do with uh, programming or uh, or uh, systems. Okay. Um, it turned out that these people got together in I think uh, 2001, and they had a conference out in Utah at the Snowbird Ski Resort. And they made uh, they made kind of common cause, and they came. They decided to call this agile. So we had the people who came from extreme programming. The people who came from Scrum. We had the people who came from other other walks of life. And they said, you know what? We have a lot of common themes, and we're going to have a bigger impact on the systems and software side of things if we make. Uh, if we join uh, together and try to emphasize what we agree on. And they came up with this thing called Agile Software Development. What are a couple of uh, characteristics of that Agile Software uh, Development? Iterative construction, okay? So the idea is that um, you don't do, don't get all the requirements, then do all the design. Then do, and then do specifications for all the programs, then write and test all the programs, okay? Um, you do some planning up front. It's not like you're not doing all the planning up front. That's why uh, the traditional uh, approach is when they say BPUF, big planning up front, what works about calling it that is that if you contrast that with Agile, Agile does planning up front. It's this lightweight planning up front. And then we get into a series of these sprints in which we do a little more uh, documenting of the requirements. And we do uh, construction. We actually construct the software in these, these iterative uh, time, time frames called sprints. Uh, and then at the every at the end of every sprint, we reevaluate, and then we pick from our list of user stories. We pick the ones that we want to go into the next sprint, and we just keep uh, going. Now this is what we call emergent 
requirements because um, we don't do as detailed a job of documenting the requirements uh, up front. We just do these lightweight user stories and we go right from that in, into sprints and in the sprints we get more information about the requirements and we just build it right there. So the details of the requirements are emerging as we build. So hence emergent requirements. Uh, so remember how we were saying back when we were talking about the plan driven approach that it made the most sense when you were thinking about projects that were like building a house. Okay. Uh, the agile point of view, uh, well, people who are thoughtful about agile, okay, they think that that it is most applicable when you're doing projects that are not like building a house. And uh, the point that we make here is more like inventing a gadget than building a house. Okay, when you're inventing a gadget, uh, there's a good uh, discussion in the text about the Wright brothers and them inventing the airplane. Well, could they have done a big plan up front about um, inventing the airplane? No, there were no airplanes. We didn't know how airplanes worked yet. Okay, we were inventing airplanes. So the more you're thinking about inventing things, the more this kind of more iterative, creative approach to uh, projects seems to make sense. Okay. Um, so for these kinds of things, like for the Wright brothers, uh, big requirements up front were not a viable option. Um, so, if, so instead, we build a little, we review a little, we revise a little. Okay. Now, this is not to promote chaos. Okay. Even before we start this, uh, uh, you know, sort of iterative uh, process, we do put planning in. Um, amongst the things that we do is that we create a vision. Okay, uh, and as we're going through the iterative process, if we come up with ideas that are not part of that vision, uh, it's sort of incumbent upon us to go back and revisit the vision. You know, either the new requirement that we discovered as we're going through these iterative uh, phases, either it doesn't belong in the project because it's inconsistent, uh, inconsistent with the statement of the vision that we had, uh, or our vision was short sighted and we've got to change that and though, and then we go get working on the requirement. So I just want to emphasize in a big way that agile is not chaotic. Okay, it's just different. Okay. And it might not be big plan up front or big requirements up front. That isn't to say that we don't document the vision uh, and express the requirements in terms of things like user stories. Okay, we do that. It's not the Wild West. Um, so uh, in the textbook as well, they're talking about the um the nature of developing uh flying machines and how we're reinventing them all the time okay and a lot of times when you're coming up with a new type of airplane um again you don't really know what you're building yet you may know what the vision is and you may be able to discover what the requirements are so you can talk about what the user stories are but do you really know the technology that you know that you're going to use some of this you're going to discover as you go so uh, here are some details about how agile projects are organized you remember that the more uh, traditional ones are organized into phases and 
uh, we saw them uh, kind of laid out like a waterfall. Well, um, the first thing we do in an Agile project is we come up with a vision statement for the project. Okay. Um, uh, they don't talk a lot about the vision statement for the project in this uh, chapter, but they do. They do, I think, uh, do a good job of talking about that in subsequent uh, chapters. Okay. Um, the next thing that we do is we identify user stories. Uh, okay, so we do spend some time and say, well, how would how would the users use our system consistent with the vision? What are the user stories that we need to support? So we we get all of those and we put them on a list and we call that the product backlog. That's this. Okay, so we have. Uh, we've done enough planning up front to understand the vision and to have enumerated the user stories before we even start this iterative process. Okay. And here's what we do for each sprint that we do uh, at the start of the sprint, we look at this backlog of user stories and we pick the ones that we think we can get done in a sprint. One interesting aspect of Agile is this thing that we call time boxing, okay? Uh, in the, the plan-driven approach, we have phases, and when we start a phase, we probably know about how long that phase is supposed to be, okay? But different phases have a different kind of uh, length. Uh, by contrast, each sprint is the same length. Now, how long are they? they're probably between one and four weeks, uh, okay? Most of us who try to coach Agile teams uh, try to get people uh, to do uh, two weeks or sometimes one. The problem is the longer the sprints are, the more, they, the, more the project starts to look like um, a plan-driven uh, project, okay? So... Sprints are one or two weeks, and so we start one and we say, what from the backlog could fit into sprint one? So that has to do with about how long we think it will take to get done, and also what's the priority? So we work with, we work with people on the stakeholder uh, side, on the, on the on the end user uh, uh, side. We 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 engage with the person who we call the product owner, who's the primary point of contact on the, on the client side. And we ask them, what are the most important user stories? Okay, and we, we allow them to pick. Now, as the technical team, we, you know, we do say, if they pick, uh, say they pick three things that don't have anything to do with each other and this is really inconvenient to do them in in that order then we'll say you know what how about you pick uh you know a and b and d instead of uh a and r and z and we negotiate okay so we pick the use of stories that we're going to do and then we get more information about the requirements and we go and we build the software and within that sprint um, we build the software to the extent that we can show it to, um, we can show it to the client organization and say, how to, uh, and ask, how does this compare to uh, uh, the way you understand your requirements? And we get to the end and hopefully uh, they go, yeah, that's it. Or we have a list of changes that we have to make. And then we go on to sprint two and we pick more user stories. And then we go on to sprint three, we pick more user stories. Now, uh, a lot of people will tell you that the plan driven approach is like a contract that upfront we come up with a giant plan and we guarantee that we're gonna get all the work done no matter what. Okay, so like it's a, like a big fixed fee uh, uh, a contract. And they, they contrast with the agile uh, approach, 
where we just agree to do some number of sprints, uh, say uh, 20, and then we're going to be done. And we'll just, we'll see what we get done. Okay, so what's going to fit into the project? Well, whatever fits into the project, whatever we've got done, by the time we're done, well, that's it. Okay, now, that's, those are the classic ways to kind of represent the two ways of doing uh, uh, projects. Now, on the Agile project, can you really go back to management and say, well, uh, this is all we got done. This is all we had time for. And management says, well, it doesn't do anything useful yet. Well, you know, we said we we're going to work for 20 sprints and we would discover how much we could get done. Um, this is what gets done. Well, are they going to be angry? Sure they are. Uh, so even though the agile approach is sort of empirical, we will discover how much will fit. Um, it has to be in some kind of rational uh, time frame so that when we get to the end of the number of sprints we've agreed upon, that people are happy, right? Back in the plan-driven approach, even though there's historically there was this uh, the kind of idea that it was one big fixed uh, contract, people have come to know over the years that um, as we go through the project, we learn about how long things uh, take and that we find out that maybe all the things that we were expecting to get, we don't get, right? Um, again, work takes as long as it takes, okay? Now, if you really are to take these two approaches and get to the heart of how they're different, okay, the Agile people only put so much effort into planning up front and then the rest of it is we discover it as we go. We have to have a pretty good idea of what we're going to discover or we're going to wind up with very unhappy people. By contrast, uh, the big plan up front uh, 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 approach might put a lot of effort into gathering detailed requirements for things that we never build because we never have any time to build them, okay? Uh, and so there is some efficiency in the agile uh, approach that we're only gathering detailed requirements for things that we're actually just about to build. Now, there are a lot of different ways to contrast these two approaches. Um, the way that we're doing it in the text is that we're saying, um, the plan-driven approach is really good for things that we know how to do and we know how to do well, like uh, building a house or a road or uh, something like that. And the agile approach is really good for things um, that we don't know a lot about, about how to do, like some kind of a gadget or some kind of a new product. And those things are true, okay? Over time, we're going to fill in more information about what's good about each of these. And we're also going to talk about a third approach, which is a hybrid of the two. The one more major option that we talk about here is the, is the hybrid. Okay, It's a combination of some of the elements of a plan-driven approach and some of the elements of Agile. Okay. Uh, it's a combination of big requirements up front, okay, and iterative construction with some replanning of the requirements. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to pause here and say there's no absolute truth about this, okay? There's no, there's no one right answer, okay? Um, but... For a particular project and a particular group of uh, players, you can come to an understanding about how to approach a project uh, that everybody can get on board with and you can do a good uh, job. So there's no magic answer here about what the right approach is. There's, there's a method that we're uh, going to explore here about how to find your way to what you're going to do. 
20, 30 years from now, will people do this uh, differently? Well, I think they probably will. But if this is the state of the art as we see it right now. So um, uh, the business analysts in the age of options, okay? So what's, what does the systems analyst do? What, do, what does the business or systems analyst uh, do? Um, well, they are a, uh, and again, is this one person? Is this a couple of people? Yes, it could be both. But they are uh, kind of in between the requirements of the business team and the technologists. OK. Um, now, there's a really interesting uh, r reference to systems analysts in uh, popular uh, culture. I looked it up earlier uh, today. There's a, sort of a cult movie called Office Space. And there's a lot of funny things in the movie. But there's one uh, character in uh He's an IT person, and I think he never really says it, but he sees himself as a uh, systems analyst. And uh, he claims that he is between the business users and uh, the developers, the IT folks. And as you watch the movie, here's what he does. He gets the requirements uh, from from the business uh, team they fax them to him and then he walks them around the office for a little while and then he refaxes them to the technology uh, uh, people and then he can't understand why people don't don't uh, think that he creates a lot of uh, value because of course the business uh, people can't uh, talk to the uh, technology people they need him well of course the refaxing approach that he has doesn't create any real value they could just uh, change the fax a number and that would be it so that's not the way to do systems analysis but it's so funny when you see it in the movie uh, if you haven't it, seen the movie uh, you just have to there are so many funny things uh, okay so if we're going to go if we're going to do a real job as a systems analyst how are we going to how how are we going to uh, help to balance the interests of the business uh, team and the technologists well we're going to be working on envision envisioning business analysis project planning and implementation approach selection, functional and technical design, project approval and execution planning, implementation via construction or configuration, deployment and maintenance. Now, uh, one of the things I'm going to I'm going, I'm going to point out, if you look at the blue people here, the business uh, team, these people are responsible for running the business in the steady state, okay? They, they're responsible for making the business operate the way it operates today, okay? It's, the, it's inherent in the notion of projects that we're going to introduce some kind of change. We're going to change the ways that the business operates. And that's going to involve some changes in things in the business and some, change, some changes in uh, technology. And we're going to wrap that up into a project and work on it. And then on a certain a day or week or month, we are going to implement it. Okay, and all the technologists are going to have to be able to make this thing run and the people in the business are going to have to be able to change the way they do business. It's going to become the new steady state. Okay, and the people who who have who have the the role, the most skin in the game in coordinating this and facilitating this uh, are you know, is are the business or systems analysts. 
Now, um, there are places like um, I've done a lot of training in uh, big insurance uh, companies here in the U.S. where there are people who have the job, they're the business analyst. Uh, they don't have a programming uh, background. Uh, they're not expected to. It's so important that we understand the requirements for systems um, well and that we express them and that we keep track of them as we go from version to version of release of uh, 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 s systems, that there are people who just focus on that and are not really... Um, are not really caught up in the technical design and the implementation. Now, I think especially with the advent of the Agile uh, approach, uh, we're doing maybe smaller projects with smaller teams. People have um, people have kind of wider roles. Oh, okay, um, so. Here's some things that we can say about the role of, you know, the analyst on the project. Um, the analyst is going to stay engaged throughout the project. Okay, um, they're going to be work on the envisioning of the project, how things are going to change, how it's going to change the software, how it's going to change the business. Okay, they're the people are going to have the earliest and most visible contact with uh, the customer and again who's the customer we don't mean a customer in terms of who's going to buy the end products of the organization we mean who who's the client who who are the business people who are we're going to be changing their business and they're going to be paying for the project now um what kind of things might be uh, kind of different uh, today, especially in the world of Agile. What might the analysts get involved with? Um, well, the Agile ap approach promotes not a big team with specialists, but a smaller team with generalists. And so for the person who's going to be the analyst uh, to fit into an Agile team, they may take on a wider role. Okay, they'd be involved in project uh, project well project selection overall when the company is a when the organization is a, a trying to decide whether we're going to do the project. Um, once we decide to do it, uh, we have to select an approach uh, to the project and plan it. Uh, Somebody has to be the project management uh, on the uh, on the agile team rather than having a project um, manager. We often have a role called scrum master. Uh, it, it, somebody has to be in charge of uh, testing and uh, documentation. So even for people who are not programmers, there's plenty to do. Even in the agile world, if you're if you're a systems analyst, there's plenty of work to be done. Even if you never touch a keyboard and create any executable uh, code. Now, uh, what we're showing here on this slide is a system development process framework, and this is kind of a modern version of the waterfall. And um, I think when you when you look at this uh, graphic, you have to see that Spurrier and Topi are trying to bring everybody into the tent. They have a big tent point of view. They want under their tent. They want to include the people with the traditional approach and the people with the agile uh, approach. So they're trying to come up with a. Um, uh, they're trying to come up with language that can apply to everybody. Well, the graphic that we have here is probably more geared to uh, the plan-driven uh, uh, approach. But he here's how 
here's how they see the sequence. There'll be some initial vi initial visioning of uh, of the project. Then we'll do business analysis. Okay, so we're going to look at the current state. Uh, we're going to identify key business transformations. That means how are we going to, how are we going to change the business? Uh, then we're going to analyze the future state. Uh, we're going to specify the initial requirements. So that's what they consider business analysis. Uh, project uh, planning and implementation approach uh, selection. They have a whole group of activities here. And then we go down and down and down. Now, what Spurrier and Topi are trying to do, which is have a big tent approach that includes everybody, and one set of language that that kind of everybody can agree on, um, it's a laudable goal. Okay, uh, will will everybody cooperate? <laughs> Okay, will everybody agree that we ought to organize a project like this and we ought to use these uh, terms and that agile people and uh, traditional people can uh, get along? Uh, probably not. Okay, but as a graduate student, okay, having this kind of really thoughtful look at a world that is changing okay, in which people disagree with each other about how to pursue projects. The Spurrier and Topi point of view is really thoughtful, okay? And whereas not everybody will agree on every term that they have here uh, or every diagram that they have here, uh, I think that they have good ideas about how to think in a comprehensive way about systems analysis in design in a world where there are a lot of options and things are changing. So can you criticize this a diagram or some other diagram? Yeah, you probably could. But uh, their heart's in the, in the right place. They're probably two of the most thoughtful people on this topic I've read in a long, long time. And um, uh, I think that kind of understanding their point of view and maybe taking it with a grain of salt because you know that not everybody agrees with it uh, can create a lot of value for you and it can kind of create a mindset about how all these things fit together and how they relate to each other because uh, the, it, the alternative if you just read the books from the Agile uh, people, uh, they have only the worst things to say about the traditional uh, people. And if you read some of the things that are written by traditional people about Agile, they've got some of the worst things to say about the Agile people. Um, and certainly, um, and, and so who's trying to have a unified view? Spurrier and Topi are trying to have a unified view. You might not agree with every last bit of what they're saying, but they put a lot of thought into it, and it's at least a good starting point for us. Okay. Uh, security, a critically important topic that involves every team member. Here's how I think this uh, got here. Okay. I think that they sent this book out for uh, for comment to their uh, their colleagues in uh, the academic world, and the comments were, "We love this book, but you don't talk enough about security." And they went, "Oh God, they're right." And they would say, "Well, where would we put it?" And then they go, "You know what?" This is a really important topic, and we better we had better talk about security in chapter one. And so they bolted this onto the back of the chapter. Okay, this happens to authors. <laughs> it's just the way of the world. So why does this you know kind of show up as a surprise in the end of chapter one? Well, 
it didn't get woven in all the way along the way. Now, we've been talking about so many things that if we were talking about security at the same time, uh, maybe that, that would have blown our minds. But that's how I think we got here. Okay. So the cybersecurity is an increasing concern. I think we at the iSchool would, would agree. Uh, we have increasing amounts of sensitive confidential data. Um, it, systems are often accessible via the internet. Uh, there's a risk of hackers, both inter internal and external hackers. Okay, so um, even though we didn't talk about this all the way through our understanding of user stories and uh, uh, analysis and design, what we're seeing here is, yeah, and the whole time all the way along, don't forget about security. Because even though people might not be talking about security specifically in their user story uh, or in their vision, uh, in the world that we're in, that's just implied. Okay. Uh, chapter summary. Um, I'm going to leave that for you to read on your own. Okay. So I really like this book. I'm hoping that you do too. Again, it tries to take a big tent approach. Uh, I think it does a credible job of talking about all the players and their point of view. It maybe tries a little too hard to come up with a common language that everybody could agree upon. Uh, these uh, these uh, parties, the traditional people and the agile people, they may never agree with each other. Okay, so, um, but the fact is, what they're doing here is a great way for us to get a big view, uh, a pretty unbiased kind of view. I don't think they're biased towards the traditional approach. I don't think that they're biased uh, towards the agile approach. They're open to things like hybrid approaches and they want to talk about it in a practical way. Um, this is the best uh, book I found in our day. And while it's not perfect, I think it's a great place to start all of our conversations. So I'm looking forward to class when we're going to uh, talk about that. And I'm going to say bye until then. Bye-bye.